So Futurama is a thing. That show that was once dubbed The Simpsons, but in space, but has easily surpassed its predecessor in every way. Except for number of seasons. This show was bolder, bigger, smarter, funnier. The episodes were larger in scope, the world was way more bizarre, and the characters were... Well, they were less yellow. If you can't tell, I'm a big fan of Futurama. The Simpsons was a show that never really captured my interest, even during the classic era before jerk-ass Homer was a thing. But Futurama was a show that I understood, even when it first came out, and I was pretty young when that happened. And thanks to its various cancellations and revivals, I still enjoy that show to this day. There always seemed to be new episodes to watch, and as I grew up, jokes from the older episodes made a lot more sense. You know, I was very young when I watched the show the first time, so I was more interested in the stupid and crude humor, like anything Bender did on screen. Bite my shine! Metal ass. But as I grew up, I began to understand the science fiction tropes and jokes that Futurama played with and the way it poked and parodied at other science fiction media. It was a fantastic show and I always enjoyed watching it and I was really bummed when it was cancelled. But that's okay because it came back. Until it was cancelled again. But that's okay because it came back. Until it was cancelled again. But that's okay because it came back. It's the only show that I know of that has four series finales, but after seven seasons, the episode, meanwhile, was a wonderful conclusion to the story, and unlike the other three times that the show was cancelled, I felt like it would be okay to say goodbye to the show. I was sad, but the show was now seven seasons long and had four movies stuffed into almost 150 episodes and was revived no less than four times. No one could expect or even wish for more than that. Moreover, that fourth finale, meanwhile, was a great way to close the show out in a meaningful way that brought two of the central characters' love story to a perfect ending. And sort of beginning. What do you say? Wanna go around again? I do. But then it came back! That's right, if you haven't heard, Futurama is back again! With the same producers and writers and, as of now, all of the original cast. I'M BACK, BABY! Now don't get me wrong, I'm not mad about this, even a little bit. I think if the writers and producers are back on board with the same characters and cast, this can only mean good episodes. But I am a little flabbergasted. I had said my goodbyes to this show in a way that felt right, and its reboot, or re-re-re-reboot, is a pleasant surprise, but it did leave me with a strange taste in my mouth. Not a bad one, but a strange one. Because as much as I think future episodes will be fantastic in regular Futurama fashion, this event is indicative of something that's been going on in the film and television landscape for a while now, and it's the fact that shows don't end anymore. And when they do, it's often not done well. And even then, they still don't really end. This is changing television in some interesting ways and affects things like the journey of watching a show, the difference in narratives, how finales affect a show, and the interaction between viewer and storyteller. I'm going to use a few different shows and franchises for example, but due to the nature of its repeated cancellation and revival and its devoted fanbase, Futurama is a great case study. And so today, I want to talk about Futurama. As far back as 1996, Fox had been pressuring Matt Groening to create another series because of the incredible success of The Simpsons. Groening teamed up with the writer and producer of The Simpsons, David Cohen, to create new characters, storylines, and concepts for a show before they had even pitched it to Fox. Despite the time the pair had spent researching and creating their new concept, Fox was resistant through the entire process. Even after the show was picked up, Fox continued to push back against Groening's ideas. But Groening fought tooth and nail to get the show on air the way he envisioned it, and in March of 1999, Futurama premiered. The show enjoyed praise from critics, and those who became fans of the series loved it for its deceptively stupid characters and crude humor as they moved through storylines parodied straight from classic science fiction, all framed in a world teeming with funny and ridiculously clever jokes, bits, and background gags. Futurama has never come close to the ratings of The Simpsons, but it quickly solidified itself as the smartest show on television, and not just because of what was happening on screen, but because the writer's room had a total of three PhDs and seven masters. I dare you to find a regular room with that much education in it, let alone a writer's room. Unfortunately, the humor and intelligence of the show were not enough to keep ratings from dropping, and in 2003, after four seasons, Fox let the show fall out of production. During this time, Cartoon Network brokered a deal with Fox to air reruns of the show. Although no new episodes were ordered, Futurama was a large draw to the brand new Adult Swim lineup along with Family Guy. Not only did this help form Adult Swim, it also kept interest in Futurama alive. The show was arguably more successful on Adult Swim and had even more new fans. Because of this, Graining and Cohen opted to try and revive the show. Comedy Central agreed to create four movies, the last of which was called Into the Wild Green Yonder, and it was once again left as an open-ended finale for the show. But in 2009, before Into the Wild Green Yonder had aired, it was revealed that Comedy Central greenlit a further season of Futurama. Because of this, the four movies were split up and slightly retooled in order to make them into separate four-episode arcs of what is now referred to as Season 5. 
Season 6 was completed and aired, and once again the show was left with an uncertain future. But a seventh and final season was ordered and aired from 2012 to 2013. Ending with a satisfying conclusion, and having thoroughly solidified itself as the show that never dies, Futurama is now an instantly recognizable adult cartoon. But now, almost a full decade since the finale of Season 7, Futurama has been thought out from its cryo chamber once again for an eighth season. I know it's over two decades old, but in case you're a young person discovering Futurama for the first time, or you were frozen for a thousand years, or whatever reason, this is your spoiler warning. Futurama starts on New Year's Eve in 1999, where the perpetually unmotivated Philip J. Fry is stuck working his pizza delivery boy job while his family and so-called friends are uninterested in his plight. Fry gets sent on a delivery and winds up in a place where people are cryogenically frozen. It's only then that Fry reads the delivery note and realizes that he and the pizza place have been pranked. Pizza delivery for... Uh... Icy wiener. Annoyed, Fry takes a seat in a chair and puts his feet up. Wallowing in his own misfortune, he watches as a new year dawns and he wonders if his life will ever get better. He then loses his balance on his tilted chair and winds up in a cryo chamber which locks and freezes with the timer set for a thousand years. And that is why your teachers tell you never to lean back in your chair. You wind up frozen for a thousand years. My parents, my co-workers, my girlfriend. I'll never see any of them again. Fry wakes up in the year 3000 and is sent to a fate assignment officer, who is an alien cyclops named Leela. She tells Fry that based on his genetics and intelligence, his perfect job is delivery boy. But Fry wants to change this and runs away with Leela in pursuit. While mistaking a suicide booth for a phone booth, Fry meets a robot bending unit named Bender Bending Rodriguez. Bender is a misanthropic con artist and the two become fast friends. While chasing Fry, Leela realizes that she's not happy with her job either and teams up with Fry and Bender to try and find a place where they can live as job deserters. Luckily, Fry has one living relative, a certified mad scientist named Hubert Farnsworth. Today the mad scientist can't get a doomsday device, tomorrow it's the mad grad student. Where will it end? He started a small company called the Planet Express in order to fund his research. He decides to hire the three fugitives on site and Fry is excited to start his new job as a delivery boy. Alright! I'm a delivery boy! For the next seven seasons, the crew of the Planet Express meet all sorts of strange alien creatures and get into all sorts of high-flying sci-fi hijinks. Whoa, that's a tongue twister. Which includes finding out where Leela is from, how to solve global warming, and my personal favorite, meet the robot devil. It's not hard to see why the show did not get the same ratings as The Simpsons. The concept and tone of the show were way wackier, higher concept, and occasionally much darker than anything that was on The Simpsons. You are now dead. Thank you for using Stop and Drop, America's favorite suicide booth since 2008. But those who did watch the show were hugely invested. Futurama has a strange fan base because the way the show is appreciated and watched means that it sits in this weird space between standalone episodes and canonical story arcs. The Simpsons is a show where you can catch any episode and are not required to have any prior knowledge of past events to enjoy that episode. The show actually takes great pains to make sure that each episode is self-contained and the events of any given episode are never permanent, beyond a few notable exceptions. Cyrus? You never mentioned him before. And I'll never mention him again! Futurama is similar in that episodes are usually singular entities, except there does seem to be more continuity. There's not so much a narrative trajectory, but a canon that continues from episode to episode. After meeting Zap Brannigan for the first time, every subsequent meeting is permeated by his need to try and get with Leela again. Kiff and Amy's relationship is ongoing, and even Leela's origin story becomes integrated into the story. And of course, because of the movies, season 5 is basically 16 episodes consisting of 4 4-episode four arcs that lead into each other. You can still watch any episode at any time, but because of this continuation, there's a kind of forward momentum, and it changes the way viewers approach the show. Narrative arcs keep people coming back every week, and while Futurama does not have that much continuation, there's a sense of wanting to know what will happen next. As such, this show sits in an interesting place where any episode can be enjoyed on its own, but there's a draw to return week after week. I think that's part of what has kept this show so relevant for so long, and why it works in the age of binge-watching. But it's also why the show was so easy to cancel, and also to revive. There was never a sense of a cliffhanger that would never be resolved like in a classic drama. So all the finales were fine the way they were, and when the show was revived, it would pick up right where it left off for the most part, and that old finale would just feel like any other episode. As a finale, Meanwhile became this great bookend because so much of the plot continuity across all of the seasons was about Leela and Fry's relationship, so when they finally get together in this crazy science fiction time loop, it feels really satisfying. And that's why I was okay with saying goodbye. But with a new season, that's still gonna be an awesome episode, it just won't be the finale anymore. But not all shows are given the same luxury. 
The enjoyment of watching a show that has a loose narrative trajectory, or none at all, is very different from a show that's built upon a grand story told across many episodes and seasons. The push to watch is because of the events, large or small, that catapult characters into collision courses with each other, which incite intrigue and betrayal and upset the previously established status quo. The enjoyment out of these shows isn't the number of laughs you can get in a 22 minute time frame, but the investment in plot, and most importantly, the characters. Not that we don't become invested in the characters of Futurama, but their circumstances are wildly unrealistic, and I'm not talking about the futuristic setting. I mean the absurd nature of the situations they find themselves in, and how the characters themselves react. We want to connect with them, but not because they're realistic, but because we want to laugh at them. We can still have emotional moments, but the drive of the show is not built on the connection with the characters beyond, I wonder what those crazy kids are going to do this time around. Good news, everyone! But in shows like Game of Thrones, Breaking Bad, or Avatar The Last Airbender even, each episode is an entry into the insights and actions of all the characters involved. They're all in service of the seasonal arc, which is in service of the series arc. The enjoyment of the show comes from watching the plot develop. And because of this emphasis on trajectory, writers and showrunners really have to stick the landing. This brings us to finales. Futurama has four and will eventually have five of these. Maybe even more if they keep going at this rate. Each of them is different and often left pretty open-ended because the show has a much more serialized format. Even Meanwhile, with its conclusion to Fry and Leela's story, could still easily be any other episode, as I suggested. If the Hulu revival chooses to skip over the events of that episode in its entirety as though it didn't happen, the new season won't suffer for it. Of course, you know where I'm going with this. Game of Thrones has possibly the most infamous finale in recent history. I'm hesitant to use the word bad as a descriptor because it's still art and art is all opinion, but the last season is a bizarre string of events that do seem to be a bit disjunct when compared to the rest of the show. On the basis of craft, I think I would call this sloppy writing brought on by apathy. I don't think the idea to have Daenerys turn out to be a terrible dragon queen was a bad idea, necessarily, but it feels grossly under-earned. It comes out of nowhere, especially for her character, and the imagery used is just visual shorthand to show some kind of change without actually doing anything to convey how she changed. She just dresses like a Disney villain. But does a bad finale ruin a show entirely? Well, not necessarily. How I Met Your Mother has a notoriously bad finale as well, but many people still love that show and rewatch it. The difference here is that How I Met Your Mother is not really about Ted meeting the kid's mom, it's about the various shenanigans that he and his friends get up to before he met their mom. The finale still sucks, but the show doesn't really suffer for it. But with Game of Thrones, I do think that the finale does change the enjoyment of the story 100%. They shat the bed on what should have been the culmination of an epic story, and it does negatively impact the series as a whole. Finales are always sad for viewers. Not sad like Game of Thrones, where it's just a sad train wreck, but sad because audiences become invested in characters, and the end of a show can be similar to the death of a loved one. I've talked about parasocial interactions in an episode about Let's Plays, and you can go check that out, but essentially viewers create attachments to characters in a similar way to how they're attached to their actual friends. As I said earlier, this is largely how you get people to keep watching. Whether a finale has a death in it or not, the loss of the show itself is a death of the parasocial interaction for the viewer, so this already makes finales a difficult feat for writers. Viewers want to see how their favorite characters are going to be left because this is the last time they will ever see them. In Futurama, Meanwhile leaves two beloved characters at a point that feels incredibly satisfying, but with the possibility for continuation. Because of the nature of the time loop in the episode, this open-ended continuation is even part of the plot. Breaking Bad sees Walter die because the nature of his arc almost demanded that that's the way he had to go out. It was still satisfying, but in a different way. Avatar The Last Airbender also sees Aang defeat the Fire Lord. Spoilers, but that was basically the whole thing they were working towards in the entire show. But he does it in a way that's very true to his own character and beliefs, while also offering the audience a spectacular fight with a wicked visual climax that expanded on the lore of the universe without betraying any previously understood mechanics or characters. Game of Thrones turns most of its characters into caricatures of their former selves and creates a farce out of what should have been a fantastical final conflict. You can't just have your characters announce how they feel! That makes me feel angry! Compared to Avatar The Last Airbender, Game of Thrones finale is a fucking joke. Instead of leaving fans sad at the loss of a show but satisfied with the conclusion, audiences were left bereft of any sense of meaning. What are the last eight seasons and countless hours of my life watching and speculating over who will sit on the Iron Throne mean if these last few episodes are going to reduce the characters I love or love to hate as cardboard cutout facsimiles of their former selves? Instead, audiences mourn the loss of their favorite characters because they no longer feel like the same person. And that isn't because of character growth. 
And that means that all the episodes before this, no matter how incredible they were to watch and how much craft and care went into them, are now tainted by the fact that their trajectory led to this trash fire. And that makes people feel like the time they spent watching, even before the finale came out, was a waste. And the show is over now. Except it's never just over. If Futurama has taught us anything, it's that shows don't die. In fact, all six of the shows I've mentioned in this whole script are all still going in some capacity. Better Call Saul is a spin-off of Breaking Bad. A How I Met Your Father is a new show from the mother's perspective. The House of Dragon is a prequel to the Game of Thrones. The Simpsons is still on air. Somebody should probably put that one out of its misery. Netflix is working on a live-action adaptation of Avatar, and now we're on the fifth revival of Futurama. Stories do not end anymore. They're just extended, recontextualized, or spun off from. This is neither a good thing or a bad thing, but it does change things a lot. For Futurama, I'm excited, but again, that's because of the nature of how the show is written and the fact that all of the finales were left open-ended on purpose. Do I think that Meanwhile was a great place to stop? Yes. Am I going to say no to more Futurama? Absolutely not. The truth is that the new season could be terrible, though. I don't think that's going to be the case because they have all the writers and producers back, but it speaks to the problem of what scholars call the post-object fandom, or rather lack of one. It used to be that after a finale, the show or movie was done. It was completed, and there was no more story to tell. If you were lucky, no more story needed to be told, and people could grow old and satisfied with the ending. You might be sad and grieve the loss of the show and its characters because you enjoyed spending time with them, but you're glad you had it. On the other hand, if the thing you love wound up sucking, you were doomed to wallow in this mediocrity. Worse still if the show was good but mishandled a few key points. But now, anything even mildly popular has a risk of being brought back. Welcome to the world of tomorrow! That show you loved that ended on a cliffhanger? It's back, and it might redeem itself. Or it might suck. But it also means that things that were popular before and have remained in good standing in the zeitgeist are more likely to be rebooted because of their popularity. No longer is anything sacred. Because if money can be made, then people will want to do it again. Executives think that they can make things the same, but different. It's not how that works. At best, this new version or reboot will be far enough detached that it will not affect the original in any way. The live-action Last Airbender movie just sort of serves as a comparison to why the show is so good. And also, how do you fuck up that story, and why are you even trying to retell what the show already did so well? Boggles my mind. But that's the catch. If popular stuff is more likely to be remade, then there's a higher probability that one of those iterations will eventually suck. And we've seen this happen over and over again. The new Fantastic Beast movies are indescribably bizarre. And even though these new shows are some of the best Star Wars ever, the sequel trilogy was astoundingly poorly handled. Maybe I'm being a bit of an alarmist. More of a good thing is sometimes just more of a good thing. But I do think that stories should be left alone when they end if that's where they were intended to end. And I'm not just aiming this at studios and executives, but at fans too. There's a difference between rallying together to bring back a show that wasn't given a proper ending, and getting overly hyped because there's going to be a prequel to a story that probably doesn't need one. Futurama being revived is an exciting prospect. The way the show's various finales were designed to be open-ended means that the showrunners understood there was always the possibility to tell more stories with these characters. The format of the show, the way the fans enjoy the show, and the way the finales were written shows a great amount of forethought and restraint, which is very appreciated. This was the same care that filled the show with smart jokes, characters, and writing. But not all shows are treated with the same kind of consideration. A finale can change the entirety of a show's meaning and the enjoyment of every previous episode in a single instant. It's something that all showrunners have to contend with, and it eats away at a lot of writers. And I'm in no way trying to say that I'm an expert or could do better. There's also the fact that an author, writer, showrunner, or a creative person may want the ending to be that way and the fans just misunderstood the point. Art is always tricky because there's no right or wrong answer. There cannot be, and I don't ever want there to be one. But I am reminded of one particular episode of the Disney show Fillmore, in which a young girl sabotages her friend in order to make sure she does not win a contest to become a character in her favorite book series. The reason she did this is because she got an advanced copy of the book, read it, and then realized that this new book spat in the face of everything she loved about the series. You didn't know how to keep your promise to your fans. That's what a book is, madame. A promise. Try keeping it next time. I think there's a kind of contract that occurs between audience and author or creator. Art will always be an individual experience, and an author has the right to do whatever they want with their story and characters. But once it's out in the world, it no longer belongs to the creator in the same way. And if it's going to be added to or change a larger piece of work, then the creator had better understand this contract with their audience. Or risk losing them. And that is what I think about Futurama and all of its finales, and the fact that it's being revived. Again. Here are my stray thoughts. 
I didn't mention anything about the alien languages in Futurama, but there are two of them, and one of them uses an actual mathematical cipher. It's just there for the fans who are dedicated enough, and I think that's awesome. There's also an episode that posited an actual mathematical equation in Quandary, and that's a legitimate thing now in the scientific community. My favorite episode is The Devil's Hands Are Idle Playthings because of that one angry line, and let's just hope this new season doesn't make me feel angry. Hey! Thanks so much for watching that episode. I'm very excited for the reboot of Futurama, and I'm also even more excited that John DiMaggio is coming back as Bender because he does such a good job, and I can't imagine the show without him or that character. Don't forget to check out our other channel, The Cinecasters, for more conversations about movies, and stick around for more awesome episodes of The Long and the Short of It, This Is a Thing, and anything else we got going down right here on Cinemasters Ultimate Timeline.